Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Howard Gould and I am co-chair of the real estate section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association along with Elizabeth Dryden of Irvin Cohn and Jessup. I um, want to welcome you to today's program and we have one or two uh, initial uh, announcements to make for you. Um, regarding membership in the Beverly Hills Bar Association, uh, they have now instituted three levels of membership. Also, I want to let you know that law students and uh, attorneys in their first three years of practice are given complimentary membership at the sustainer level. So please be sure, be sure to let uh, your friends and colleagues know about that opportunity uh, where they can get some free MCLE and participate in the referral network uh, for the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Um, it's, uh, I want to also mention we've been we restarted this section um, with our first program in January and have been doing programs about every other month since then. Um, we're going to be doing probably every month uh, for several months going forward. We plan to have some COVID-19 related programs in the next couple of months. Uh, September 24th and October 29th are our program dates and we're looking at doing a program on landlord tenant issues and the various um, laws that are in, in play and everyone's wondering you know what's going to be happening going forward with the rent deferrals um, and and how that is playing out and we plan to also probably do a program on financing during the COVID-19 period um, potentially uh, talking about the mortgage uh, uh, default issues and how those may play out. We also plan a program potentially in November about foreign investment in U.S. real estate, um, and we already um, have one or two of our speakers lined up for that program. So please look for these programs that are coming up soon. In terms of today's program, uh, we have periodically over the years and in, on pretty much almost an annual basis uh, been fortunate to have a speaker from the California Association of Realtors and in recent years, that has generally been Neil Kalin, and we are extremely happy to have Neil joining us again today to talk about some of their new forms and changes in forms that are existing uh, with a particular emphasis on the changes that CAR has made in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, Neil joined California Association of Realtors in 1987 he is now Assistant General Counsel at CAR. He is their senior, senior legal advisor to CAR's Standard Forms Committee. And, and it's uh, always a pleasure to listen to Neil talk about the forms, where they've been, where they are now, and possibly where they're going, because you can't find anyone more knowledgeable about this than Neil. And of course, those forms in the residential area and sometimes in other areas are uh, prolific and used pretty much by everybody. Neil uh, provides uh, advice to CAR members on their legal hotline, um, and he writes many of CAR's appellate court briefs. He's an arbitrator for the American Arbitration Association and has served as a judge pro tem and a volunteer mediator and arbitrator for the Los Angeles County Superior Court. Uh, he's also immediate past co-chair of the State Bar's real estate section, so he has a broad view of what's been going on for lawyers in, in terms of uh, state bar and other bar association activities. Uh, he earned his CIPS designation, which is Certified International Property Specialist from NAR in 2001. Uh, and Neil received his Bachelor of Science degree in Accounting uh, from the University of Illinois, um, and also his Certificate of Public Accountancy uh, at the same time as he graduated college. And he is a graduate uh, of the UCLA School of Law in 1985. And Neil, thank you very much for joining us. You're quite welcome, Howard. It's, a, it's such a pleasure to be back. Um, and this time, you know, com completely completely virtual. We've, we've done some in the past. We've done some meetings that were at the Beverly Hills Bar office that were, I guess, simulcast or webcast at the same time. So we're doing something a little bit different time this time. And it, it's great to be back. And I'm ready to get into the program whenever you're ready for me. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, great. 
good. So I'm going to talk about, you know, the, the recent form updates that, we, that we've had here at CAR. CAR releases forms generally twice a year in June and in December. So I'm going to talk about some of the ones that happened in June. And we have been having continual updates for our library of coronavirus or COVID-19 forms. So I, I should have some time to at least make you aware of that library and how it may impact you as a lawyer in the real estate field. There we go, so here's what I'm gonna talk about. I, there was just two new forms that were introduced in June, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about both of those. There were many forms that were revised in June. There was, I believe there was 11 forms that were revised. Um, some of those in the landlord-tenant area that I think are important uh, for your practice. So I'm going to mention all of those, but I'm just going to talk about two of the revised sales forms, as you can see in your list. And then we've got this whole library. We've got this library of 10 forms. It's really eight forms and two documents. They're not really forms. But I'm going to go through those just so you're familiar with them. Because especially if you have real estate licensees as clients, they need to be familiar with them or they may be bringing you some of these forms to your attention so you can figure out how to negotiate or how something works. So that's, that's my agenda for today. We'll start at the beginning. We're going to talk about the brand new forms that were released in June, the square footage and lot size disclosure and advisory, and the property visit and open house advisor. So let's start with the square footage one. And pretty simple form. It basically is, like I say, it's called a disclosure and an advisor because it does two things at once. The most important part right there is right at the beginning of paragraph one. It tells the client, whether it's a buyer client or seller client, really the, important in, the importance of this form is that it gets into a buyer's hand, right? And it tells the buyer, listen, there's no one official source for sizing property. Different sources can come up with different sizes. And you know, as, as, you, as you may have heard in real estate licensees are very familiar. Well, the architect tends to you know, be boasting and has, the, has the, the biggest measurement way to measure the property. Um, and, and then the property tax assessor always seems to think a property is bigger than the owner thinks it is. Um, of course, the owner always thinks it's bigger than a buyer thinks it is, the owner who's lived there for a while. And then, of course, you get the appraiser for the lender who thinks it's like the smallest thing possible, right? So there's different ways to measure properties. It does not mean that some of them are illegitimate. There's just different ways to do it. Um, members and their clients get very confused, and a lot of buyers get very unhappy when they think they're getting something with so many square feet, and then afterwards, somebody else tells them, no, it's not really that big, it's a different size. So this form is putting them out there, notice there's no one official size. If you as a buyer want, if that's important to you, specifically to know the square footage or the lot size, because this form deals with both of the improvement and the lot size itself, great, no problem. Hire your own expert. Don't rely on these other sources of information. And that information is in paragraph one. That information is in paragraph two as well. I've got a red box there that's highlighted in paragraph two. Buyer, you should independently investigate. Who should you get? Well, the best person to get is a licensed surveyor. Does that happen a lot in residential? Quite honestly, no, it doesn't. Okay. People tend to rely on the lender's appraiser. That's probably the most common. But if it's that important to somebody to have a specific number, then they should at least hire somebody on their own to do it. So the, this is all, it's a one page form. This is the bottom part of the form. What's here? Well, we wanna get all of the different sources out in the open. We don't want to have our members to be subject to claims that they revealed 
you know, the largest square foot estimate and did not reveal some of the lowest square foot estimates. Put it all out there, let the buyer make a decision when they have full information. It's the best way, of course, to avoid claims. That whole first section, that graph, there's a lot of different things there. What's the square footage that's in some kind of public record or in the multiple listing service? What does the seller say the square footage? That happens a lot. You know, the seller says, well, I disagree with what the appraiser says. I disagree with what the drawings say. I disagree with the map, you know. This is really what the, what the, what the measurement is. Okay, so if the seller's gonna make their representation, put down what the seller says it is and where the seller is getting it. And if you look at the column all the way on the right, if you have documentation to support that statement, check the box and make sure that documentation is attached. Again, full disclosure is always the best approach. Paragraph five, that's the advisory. Again, what was said in paragraph one and paragraph two, buyers, if this is important to you, investigate on your own, hire an expert to give you your own figure. And notice the representation above the seller's signature. Seller is not aware of any other measurements of the property. So, so it's possible that the brokerage might fill out this form because they might have more information. It's possible that the seller will fill out this form. The best approach is to have the seller and the seller's brokerage working together to fill out the form. And then the seller signs above that representation. This is all that I know about the property. So that's a new form. We found that many brokerage companies had their own version of this type of document already. And as what often happens in the brokerage field, brokerage A has one form, brokerage B has another form. All of a sudden you get two forms. They may say the same thing, they may say conflicting things. It's very confusing in the transaction. We decided we'd come up with one that hopefully creates more standardization in the industry. So that's the first new form that was released that was released in June. The second one seemed to be a very odd time to release this form. Property visit and open house advisor. And what's the purpose of this form? Well, the purpose of this form is to warn people who are coming onto a property. And we'll talk about why the timing is just a little bit awkward with this form in a few moments. But that's the whole point of this form is it's basically a warning, right? The first paragraph, reflects the reality today. Recordings are everywhere. You may not know it. It's not a matter of the of the hidden teddy bear cam that's somewhere on the property. There could be visible cameras. There could be non-visible cameras. There's recording devices, right? Almost everybody has, what, a Google Home or an Amazon Alexa or something like that that is listening whether you want it to or not. So paragraph one, it's a warning. There's audio. There could be audio recording devices. You may see them. You may not see them. If you want to have conversations about the property, what's your best bet? Go outside. Go outside. Go away from the property. Have that conversation with your real estate licensee. There's a, a very almost notorious case that a lot of licensees have heard about where a buyer was talking about the maximum that they would count that they would be willing to pay. They made an offer on the property. Lo and behold, what did the seller counter at? The seller counted at exactly that amount, right? They never had that conversation with the seller, never had that conversation with the listing agent. It was a device that the seller was able to hear that conversation between the buyer and the buyer's agent. Magically that happened, you know, and then these issues got raised. I wasn't aware you seem to have been listening to. So that's paragraph one. Paragraph two is basically a safe, you know, a safety issue, which is, hey, anytime you're walking onto property that you're not familiar with, something can happen. You miss a step. Um, you know, the railing is loose. You slip on the floor because the floors were, were just cleaned or waxed or polished. You're outside, there's uneven grass, there's uneven ground, there's hillside. Hey, there's a lot of things that can go wrong when you're walking on somebody else's property. Paragraph two says, be careful. 
Paragraph three. Of course, it's common for sellers to leave the property when a prospect is coming through and viewing it, but often they leave their pets. Sometimes the pets are, are closed off, maybe by a gate, maybe by a door, maybe they're not at all, right? So paragraph three is, watch out, you know, something could look all nice and cuddly and friendly, and it may not be so. So watch out for animals and pets. Paragraph four, hey, paragraph four is kind of like the, um, he, you buy it, he, you break it, you buy it um, theory, which is, you've got this property that, you know, if you're bringing minors in, it's your responsibility as a visitor to take care of the minors, to watch over them, to make sure that they do not experience any of these problems. And of course, paragraph five, the risk of injury. Look at that big language right there at the end of five. Visitor agrees to assume the risk of entering the property, right? So this is really for any kind of visits or it's for open houses. And when we get to our coronavirus forms, we're gonna find that open houses are really severely limited in today's environment. Okay, so there was my you break it, you buy it picture. I didn't even realize I was there. And Howard, um, I don't know if you know anybody had any issues, but before we go on to our next segment, I thought I would just stop and see if there's any questions on those first I two believe, I don't believe so. Okay, great, so we'll move on. So we're gonna go to the revised sales form. There's really just two that I thought you as legal practitioners interested in or real estate issues would want to know about. And that's a residential listing agreement. Of course, a very popular form. And the real estate transfer disclosure statement. And there was a change that actually happened to that form early in the year, but we made it a formal, what we call a formal revision for the June revision. So let's start by looking at the listing agreement. And there's a lot of formatting changes into this in this um, document. There were some sentences that were moved around. There's some different languages. But as a legal practitioner, I think probably the most important aspect is this new paragraph seven that addresses public marketing of the property. And the National Association of Realtors passed a rule last year that came into effect in May of this year that said if you if you belong to a multiple listing service and it has to be a multiple listing service that has some kind of realtor ownership in it and that's true throughout the state with only two exceptions throughout the state so imagine most of your business is probably here in southern california they're going to be subject to what's called the clear cooperation policy and this policy was instituted to make sure that listings get placed on the MLS with the belief that MLS has the broadest exposure of properties. And the purpose of the MLS is to have listings on it so that all members out in the field can see what is available and that is deemed to be best for the industry as a whole and also for sellers to help them get the maximum price for their property. But there's been a, there was a trend over the last several years of offices that would take a listing, would try to market it privately and keep it off the multiple listing service. And so NAR through its membership says, that's really detrimental to the industry as a whole, and they think detrimental as a general rule for sellers as a whole. So they passed this rule that said, once a property is publicly marketed, that property has to be placed on the multiple listing service within one business day. So what can a company do that wants to try to, that has a listing, wants to try to have an in-house sale does not like the multiple listing service mechanism or thinks that that's not the best way to approach the marketing for a particular property. Well, they can, they can avoid placing the property on the multiple listing service as long as all activity 
all marketing activity is done through the brokerage, which means the broker or salespeople working through the broker and their clients on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Okay, one-on-one -on -one basis. So the broker could say, we have a listing at um, 525 South Virgil, which is uh, the CAR's office. 525 South Virgil, you know, let's just say it was a home. We have a listing on that property. The brokerage could send out a notice to all of the licensees, whether it's a two-person office or a two-person company, I should say, or whether they have a thousand agents working for that, that brokerage company. Doesn't matter. And then the individual licensees can make one-on-one -on -one contacts with their clients to tell them about this property. But as soon as the listing licensee does anything public, then that listing has to be placed on the multiple listing service within one business day. What's public? Well, if you look at paragraph 7B, you can take a look and you see there's a whole list of things that are public. So public facing websites, um, window signs, yard signs, email blasts, right? Email blasts are not one-on-one -on -one communication between a licensee and a client. So once you have any of that public marketing, the listing is required under NAR rules to be placed on the multiple listing service within one business day. Also added here was paragraph 7C, something called coming soon. Now, what is coming soon? What, what is coming soon? Is there, is there some, does it have some kind of official meaning? Does it have some kind of state meaning, some kind of national meaning? And the answer there is no, right? Because different MLSs have taken this concept of coming soon and have defined it differently for different geographic areas, right? So what happened was when licensees were making an effort to avoid the MLS to say, well, maybe we don't have a listing yet, but the seller has given us permission to start promoting or marketing this listing, even though we don't have it yet. So it's coming soon. But they'll say there was no listing, so there was nothing to put onto the MLS, right? Well, of course, marketing a property without having a listing in writing jeopardizes the licensee's ability to get a commission if the property actually goes into a transaction, right? So members kind of figure that out. They said, well, we want to take a listing, but if we don't want to start it right away. All right, but now that we have this clear cooperation policy, you can't really hold it off of the MLS any longer if you're gonna do any kind of public marketing. So what does coming soon actually mean? The real answer to that is you need to look to your MLS to find out what it actually means. In light of the NAR clear cooperation policy, coming soon, impact may be limited, but my understanding is with a lot of MLSs, there's one area that it does affect that impacts, impacts realtors marketing strategy, and it's something called days on market or days on MLS. How long has this property been out there? Of course, in today's marketplace, there's very few listings and there's so many buyers that properties aren't listed for very long anyway. So you just generally don't see long periods of time, whether it's days on the market or days on MLS. Of course, a lot of brokers like to advertise, you know, come with me, market with me, you know, uh, my average day on market is, you know, some low amount, right? So they, it's good for them for marketing purposes. Their cooperation policy might have some impact in that arena, but given the hot market throughout the entire state of California, it actually may be more limited. The key issue here, it says there in C, I have it highlighted in yellow, discuss with the broker what coming soon actually means for the purpose of your property. So that was one form that I thought you'd want to know about. To me, that was the most significant change that you as lawyers would want to know about. Now we have the real estate transfer disclosure statement. Of course, this is a statutory form. It's been required for over 30 years. And for 30 years, 
Section one of this form has basically been ignored. Right? Section two is the section that has A, B, C, and D in it. That's the section the seller fills out. Section three is where the listing agent fills out. Section four is where the buyer's agent fills out. Listing agent and buyer's agent can use the transfer disclosure statement to document their diligent visual inspection disclosure. But ever since it first came into being, there's been section one and no one's ever really known what to do with section one. And it says coordination with other disclosure forms. But then you have this bold heading that says substituted disclosures. And the sentence is a very long sentence. It's very hard to read. You can tell it was written by the legislature. The following disclosures and other disclosures required by law, including things like the NHD reports, and it talks about a variety of things that are kind of in commas, goes on to say, have or will be made in connection with the real estate transfer, and then it says, at almost the last line, and are intended to satisfy the disclosure obligations on this form where the subject matter is the same. So it sounds like these disclosures, if we're reading this correctly for the last 30 years, which is, it is the seller is gonna use some kind of report in place of their own disclosure. It is a substitute disclosure for something that the seller would have to do. And up until the beginning of this year, there was only two options to check that. The first one about inspections and reports, completed pursuant to basically a contract, and additional inspections, reports, or disclosures. Well, January 1st, a new box was added because no one did anything. Realistically, no one did anything with this section for 30 plus years. But some attorneys were arguing, well, if this section is not filled out, then the form is not complete. And under the law, a buyer has either a three-day or a five-day right to cancel or rescind once they receive a completed form. And I said, well, but nobody's doing anything here. And there's nothing to complete because re nobody's really substituting. No one would tell a seller, no broker would tell a seller, yeah, just rely on some third party, regardless of your own knowledge. That's kind of silly. So a box was added, this third box that says no substituted disclosure for this transfer. And our view at CAR is that's the box that most likely should be checked all the time because the seller really should not rely on anybody else to make a disclosure for them. Now, what I've heard from the field is that some attorneys are telling their broker clients who have sell or their seller clients, just write in any inspection or report you have, write that in basically under the second box. Don't use it as a substituted disclosure. Basically use this part of the form as a supplemental disclosure. We think that's probably unnecessary. There's another form called the seller property questionnaire. There's a few questions in that questionnaire that explicitly tell people about prior reports, prior documents, prior inspections, and the need to deliver those. Those are truly supplements as opposed to substitutes, but you've got this third box here, again, widely ignored for 30 plus years. We're gonna see what happens now that this third box was added because of those claims that some of our members were receiving, or really their clients were receiving, saying the form wasn't complete because nothing was put down in section one. So those are the two transactional forms. Howard, is there anything uh, there that I should address before I move on? There was a question about the clear cooperation clause. Okay. Uh, are these cooper cooperation rules a protective response to challenges created by new brokering models online and other words, otherwise? Well, I guess that's going to depend on one's point of view. From the point of view of the National Association of Realtors, no. From the point of view of the National Association of Realtors, 
there are substantial societal benefits to listing properties through the MLS. And there are a couple of court cases that are challenging the NAR clear cooperation rule. Nothing, is, nothing significantly has happened with those cases as of now. Um, although there was one of those cases where they tried to get an injunction to stop the implementation of the clear cooperation rule and that injunction was denied. So these cases are still alive. You know, some people who have business models are saying this is an interference. But I have to tell you, who votes on these issues? Realtor members of NAR vote on these issues. And realtor members said, no, it's overall it's beneficial to the consumer to have properties placed into the multiple listing service. Of course, NAR says they're going to vigorously challenge uh, those lawsuits that have made the argument that it's anti-competitive. I personally, I don't think that's why NAR did it. NAR said there, this is a good service for both members and their clients. Ultimately, we'll see what happens as those lawsuits progress. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go on to some more revisions in June of this year. And these have to do with our landlord tenant notice forms. So the change in terms of tenancy, the termination of tenancy, and the three quit forms, the pay rent, the notice to quit, and what's now called the notice to cure or perform covenant or quit. And these forms were changed because effective January 1st, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019 came into effect, which did what? Imposed essentially statewide rent caps and eviction controls throughout California, even if there was no local rent or eviction control in place. And the rules are a little bit difficult. And when we first came out with a modification to the CR forms to reflect the law as of January 1st, we said, wow, this is pretty complicated. We don't want our members to get into an issue where property is subject to these laws because there are exemptions. So our first draft that went through the middle of this year just dealt with properties that were exempt. And our member said, well, that's not really providing a service for us. We need to address both situations, either when they're exempt or when they're not exempt. And so that's what we've done. Those five forms have been changed. There's some common themes that run through them. You'll see when I get to those screens. So all of the forms have an explanation. What is this Tenant Protection Act all about? An explanation that local rent and eviction controls probably preempt and supersede the TPA. Why is that important? Well, you need to seek legal counsel. So that's why I'm bringing these up for this audience, right? We created boxed paragraphs for members to, who are using these forms so that it's very clear they're either dealing with covered property or they're dealing with exempt property. And what is allowed is different whether something's covered or whether something is exempt. And we have a note that talks about the most common exemptions to the TPA. So what are the most common exemptions? Single family residential property, essentially. Property that has a certificate of occupancy within the last 15 years. Okay. Notice it doesn't date back to 2005, so we think it's a rolling 15 year period. And the third exemption is for uh, duplexes, uh, one of which is owner occupied. And then there's some minor common themes that we have for our uh, notices involving a quit, and you see those there. So let's look at a few of these. So we're gonna start with the change in terms of tenancy. And you can see that first paragraph is that common explanation. What's the TPA all about? Second paragraph, 
common explanation, local rent control and eviction laws are probably gonna preempt or supersede. Then we get down to, for a change in terms, okay, so if we're changing the terms, what do most people change? They change the rent amount, right? So here you have for covered properties, a landlord can increase the rent by 5% or less without any special dispensation. But if the landlord wants to increase the rent by more than 5%, there is a cap in the TPA, right? And so there's, that's why that's a separate paragraph because it refers one to the civil code. Quite honestly, difficult to understand because it's talking about cost of living adjustments and do you apply the federal rule and the federal rule uses one word, but the TPA uses different words. So it's been very difficult for people to understand. We just heard that in some jurisdictions in California this year, there is a negative cost of living. Wow, a negative cost of living, what does that mean? Well, you're still allowed to increase by 5%. It's right? still allowed to increase by 5%. Notice what it says there at the bottom of paragraph two, in the covered properties, in no event greater than 10%. So there's an ultimate cap. Even if you have cost of living, you're gonna, if you wanna increase more than five, you can never go higher than 10 for a rent increase. What about for properties that are not covered? Well, the difference is, are you raising the rent by more than 10%, okay? Um, or 10% or less. And the reason there's a difference there is for Timing, you have to give greater notice if you're going to increase the rent greater than 10%. But quite honestly, now you can't do it anyway. Why can you not raise the rent greater than 10% now anyway? Um, because that would be considered rent gouging. You cannot increase greater than 10% for an area that is covered by a state of emergency. Guess what? We have a statewide state of emergency due to COVID 19. So I think that would prohibit any rent increases of greater than 10% um, until that state of emergency ends. Normally you would think of the state of emergencies dealing with you know, areas that have had fires or earthquakes or the like, or flooding, right? So we deal with it separately. Then the, the third box there, all properties dealing with security deposits or having them add what we call our rent cap and just cause addendum to bring these terms into play. So a lot of commonalities we'll see when we get to our termination notice. The first two paragraphs are already covered them. We have those in every one of these forms. What about terminating a tenancy that's covered by the TPA? Well, there's only certain reasons you can terminate a tenancy. They're listed there, A, B, C, and D. Family move in, owner intends to withdraw the property. What does that mean? No clear definition of that. Owner intends to demolish or substantially remodel. Okay, that's gotta be something significant. You're not just gonna paint. You're not just gonna repair a broken door. You're not just gonna repair a toilet, okay? okay. In order to allow a termination of tenancy, it has to be demolished or substantial remodel. Okay, or of course, maybe the owner has to comply with the court order. <clears throat> and then you can see in any of those cases, Again, this is statewide, you're covered under the TPA. Any of those allowable cases to terminate the tenancy, tenant is entitled to a one month relocation expense. Hey, compared to a lot of local rent control laws, one month is nothing. Next part of the termination of tenancy, this is for properties that are exempt. No, TPA doesn't apply. So now we just go with our normal rules Usually a 60 day notice is required. Could be 30 if people that they're less than a year, 90 for government subsidized housing and, then, and the like. And then you get down where we see our um, exemption arrow and it talks about the exemptions that I told you about before. Interesting, we added something here, the notice of termination of tenancy to tell people that's not always the right form. If somebody's not paying rent, use the pay rent or quit. If somebody is violating some term of their lease, 
used to perform notice to cure or perform covenant, right? If somebody's doing something that they're absolutely not allowed to do, just use a notice to quit. Pay rent or quit. The only thing that we did here, it's in that green box at the bottom of the page, at the bottom of the screen. Notice that it says you don't count Saturdays, Sundays, or judicial holidays in figuring out the three days. I will remind people, the state law that said you don't count the Saturdays, Sundays, and judicial holidays does not require that that language be in the body of the form itself. But what were we hearing? We were hearing that in certain jurisdictions, judges were insisting on it. I don't know if the judges were misreading the law or if, they, or if there was a local court rule. We said, as long as that's what's really happening on the field, we're going to include that language in our form. The notice to cure or perform covenant, why is it that way? It used to be three-day notice to perform covenant or quit. Do what you're supposed to do. Remove the pet that's not allowed, right? Or you're out. Well, if you're in a covered property, a TPA covered property, three day notice is really now realistically a minimum of six days. You have to give a three day notice to cure, and I've got the list of things that most commonly would come up extending the lease, the Tenant is not allowing the owner to come in. The tenant is not paying a non-rent monetary obligation. Maybe they're supposed to pay utilities separately outside of the rent amount. Or they're supposed to perform some other covenant. If it's a covered property, they have to be given a three-day notice to cure first. After that three-day notice expires, then they can be given a three-day notice to quit. So for covered properties, Performance is really turned from three days into six days. And here it is for exempt properties, again, a separate section. And at the very bottom, again, the same language you saw before, here's the common exemptions. Notice to quit, there are some reasons even under TPA where you can just terminate a lease automatically without giving any three-day notice at all. They're listed right here. Um, what are good examples? Maintaining a nuisance, using the property for an unlawful purpose, um, violating the covenant against subletting, assignment, and the like. Of course, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Judicial Council order. There's no summonses being issued by the courts. So even somebody who's doing something, you may still not be able to get them out even if you issue a notice to quit, until we get a change in the Judicial Council order, evictions have effectively been halted throughout California. <clears throat> Maybe you gave that three-day notice to cure, the tenant did not cure, then the next step is to give the notice to quit. And you see under paragraph 3F, there are some of those boxes to be checked that correspond to the notice to cure that would have been issued first. Okay. Um, Howard, that's it for those forms. So before I go on to our coronavirus library, do you have some questions? Um, I have a question for you. Uh, there, in, in the past, has generally been language about forfeiture of the lease. And uh, did that play a role in any of these forms? I think we have that, I think we kept that still in one of them. Give me a moment. The notice to cure. Under the second portion where it's not subject to, let's see. Yeah, and, and the, the only thing we kept here, and you see at the top part of this form, so this is the notice to cure, right? Um, if you do not, you are required to comply with the following or vacate the premises and surrender possession. So that is still, that's still there, not the, not the forfeiture language. And we might still have that in the A rent. Let me double check. Yeah, we just have two, vacate the premises and surrender possession. 
So we might have taken out that actual forfeiture language itself. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if there's any legal consequences. What I would say is we don't think substantively there is. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully we'll never find out. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so last, I got 10 minutes. We got 10 forms here. This is our coronavirus library. <clears throat> Two of them are strictly transactional. Um, most of them, several of them deal with showings. And so let me just jump right in. There's the first one is our addendum or amendment. This form came out, it was last revised April 30th. It came out, I think, at the end of March. I haven't revised it. This form, because the CAR contracts do not have an, uh, an act of God clause, um, we said, well, what's happening with this, you know, coronavirus, if somebody, have, if somebody gets it, if there's, there's stay-home orders, if there's shutdown orders, how is that going to affect the transaction? We don't know. The best way to deal with it is to address it head on. <clears throat> so we created this form that could be used at the time the contract is entered into, or it might be used at a later point in time. It deals with different options, extending time for contingencies, extending time for closing escrow, or just the parties mutual agree to cancel. The most common question I get in this form is, is it mandated? And the answer is no, it's not mandated. We just think rather than have uncertainty, why not address the issue head on? This form enables the party to use it head on had widespread use in April, probably in May. I'm hearing from members in the field, they've kind of adjusted the coronavirus and it's almost like nothing new anymore. So it's not a surprise. You notice here, paragraph three says, one has to give a notice of unforeseen coronavirus circumstances. So are they really unforeseen now that our initial you know, two week lockdown has lasted for four and a half months? You know, I don't know. We're finding our members are not using this form as much as they did originally. If it comes up, well, this form that's on your screen now goes hand in hand with it. Which is, what's the circumstances that's causing you, buyer, or you, seller, to have a delay? Is it loan related? Is it because of a stay at home order? Is it because of some personal impact? This form is a really good form because even if there's been no agreement, I think this form is a good form to be used by whoever's asking for the extension, the delay, the cancellation, because it's showing their good faith. Now, a lot of items in this form don't really apply anymore. So, for example, it's not difficult to get a notary to come out to a property anymore. Lender delays have been substantially reduced. Appraiser delays have been substantially reduced. Those are items in 1A. They're really not that significant anymore. Paragraph 1B. You can get home inspections. We now know that in California, real estate is an essential service and it's allowed to go on. You can get home inspections. You can get stagers. You can have government inspections. You can get appraisers. You can get pest control inspections. But what about 1C? Well, maybe you have a confirmed diagnosis. That really changes things, right? So this form really could show somebody's good faith. The next form we have, which is getting a lot of use these days, it's an amendment to the listing agreement where the seller says, I'm either gonna allow showings or I'm not. I'm gonna allow marketing activity or I'm not. I'm gonna allow post acceptance activities or I'm not, okay? I agree that if I'm gonna allow showings, I'm going to sign this form that we call the PEED form. I'll get to that next. Where the seller gives permission and the seller makes representations that the seller is not afflicted with COVID. To the best of the seller's knowledge, they haven't been in the last two weeks in touch with somebody or in contact with somebody, right? Um, so they, and, and that they're allowing it and they're, they're assuming the risk, okay? So the seller is making representation. One reason I wanted to bring this form up is the second page. So let's say the seller says, I don't want anybody coming onto my property. Now we all know these days, 
open houses can be done virtually. Don't, somebody doesn't really have to go into it. But the seller says, I don't want anybody in my house for any reason. Well, that's going to affect the contract because the purchase agreement specifically allows access to the property for inspections and investigations. And if the seller absolutely prohibits access to the property, some kind of modification is gonna to need to be made to the purchase agreement. And that's where you as real estate lawyers would have to come in. CAR does not have standard single clauses. And so somebody would have to draft something if the seller is prohibiting all access to the property. You see that in paragraph 4B, the recommendation that the parties talk to attorney and have an attorney draft something that would modify the standard language in the contract. <clears throat> All right, so the first of our PEAD form, property entry, advisory, and declaration. The first one is for the seller. Again, the seller is making those representations. You see those in paragraph five. I'm not afflicted with. As far as I know, I haven't been in touch with somebody and I don't have signs of COVID-19, right? Fever, respiratory illnesses and the like. And something we added recently is paragraph six, which is the seller is making these representations for any minors on the property as well. You see, you can have up to three people signing this property at a time, this form at a time. If you have more than three sellers or occupants. People say, who's an occupant that's not a seller? I'll give you a good example. My daughter, um, gave notice in her apartment and until her new apartment is ready, she's an occupant of my house. Somebody was coming through, she would probably have to sign this PEDS form as an occupant of the property. Maybe you have elderly parents that are living with you. They may not be the owners of the property, they're not the sellers, but they're occupants. So we also have the same type form that would really be used in a landlord tenant relationship. It's for the owner, the landlord, okay, or the tenant to sign. Same concept as with the one that the seller would sign. Again, different names, that's why I have those highlighted here. And then the one that's getting a lot of attention these days is what we call the PEED V form for visitor. And you see that box up at the top, a new declaration should be attained for each visitor each time they enter. So that's causing a lot of difficulty out in the field. People are saying, wait a minute, my prospect looked at the property yesterday. They want to look at it again tomorrow. Do they really have to sign a new PV form? And the answer is yes. Now, all of this has to be done electronically. So it's not like we're tearing down rainforest to do this. Um, but there is record keeping requirements that need to be met. Why? Well, because a person's circumstances could change. <clears throat> Our committee looked at having, of just only having an update form or only giving a form if something has changed. And our members have said, you know what? We're very happy that real estate industry is deemed to be an essential service so our members can continue to do business. They are concerned that we start having people coming through without making these representations, the state might consider real estate showings, so-called open houses to be super spreader events and they'll take away the essential service designation for real estate licensees. So we're sticking with this for now. You can list more than one property though. If somebody's gonna see four properties on the same day, they can use one form, list four properties. By the way, some of you may wanna see where is some of this information? There's guidance from the California Department of Health Services, from Cal OSHA, and you see the highlighted paragraphs. I gave links to where you could find those documents. Guidance, by the way, from the Department of Health Services. Guidance is not guidance. Guidance is not voluntary. Guidance is mandatory. Guidance is actually the law. It's really kind of a misnomer. That they use. Who would sign this? Somebody entering the property maybe a buyer, uh, maybe a prospective tenant, maybe the broker, maybe an inspector, maybe a repair person, and the like. Going hand in hand with those PVs, 
we've got something called best practices. Notice the only thing I want to point out here, there's language in paragraph two and paragraph three. Open houses, as they used to be known, are not allowed anymore. There's no open house where somebody could just drop by and come into the property. Appointments have to be made. These forms need to be signed digitally in advance. There has to be cleaning in between showings. Anyone who comes in has to have a facial covering, okay? And they have to keep social distancing. You can't have an open house and have a lot of people streaming through, not permitted anymore. Uh, we have a document we call the Posted Rules of Entry. These things need to be posted on the property. It's two pages. One is this, which is text. The other is a pictogram. And finally, we have two forms dealing with, and I see we're at the end of our time, so maybe we'll take a few questions and we'll terminate. Two forms dealing with the rental situation. First one is a letter that would go from the landlord to the tenant saying, you know, are you having issues? If so, let me know. The next one is the actual agreement for rent, pe rent repayment. It defines whether the landlord has been notified, what the reasons are, the proof of the inability to pay, identify the months and the amount, because some people are paying a prorated amount I'm hearing out in the field. So it's not just a complete failure to pay. And then the repayment plan, and some cities allow 90 days, some allow six months, some cities allow up to 12 months to repay back due rent. Again, you gotta check. I don't know what the rule is in Beverly Hills. Some cities have created their own form. If that's the case in Beverly Hills, you gotta use their form. Our form is pretty generic. It could probably be used in most places throughout the state. Some cities don't require any proof. So I mentioned before, there's that one paragraph, paragraph four dealing with proof of inability to pay. If you're in a jurisdiction that doesn't require proof, then that paragraph can be ignored or can be stricken. So we just have a couple of tools that are out there. Hopefully they're useful for you. Uh, Howard, I know we're at 1.30, sorry uh, to end just at the moment, but I'm willing to stay for a few minutes if you have questions. Um, I actually do not have any questions that I see in the chat uh, column. So I want to thank you again, Neil, for uh, coming and joining us and giving us the uh, really insider's view of all the CAR changes on these forms and what's going on in the industry. I can say from personal experience that that PV form is uh, being used universally for anybody going in to look at a property. I, whether the broker or anybody is there or not. But thank you again, Neil and- um, Howard, Howard, can I give a very long in advance promo, which is next year, whether you have me or you have somebody else from CAR. CAR was going to revise its primary purchase agreement this year. We postponed that because of the, uh, the COVID pandemic. It is being released at the end of next year. So I think we will have a really good meeting next year. Uh, it, there's a lot of substantial revisions coming next year. So I want to remember just to think about that, but it won't happen for a year. When, is that being released at the end of 2020? No, it's being released at the end of 2021. Um, so yeah, that, that's really a, a long, long view ahead. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Thank you again, Neil, and thank you to everyone for attending our program. Hope to see you at our future events. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron.